Hello my friends and welcome to version 2.0 of my traits guide. So in my original traits guide, um, I taught an approach to traits which was to say that I said think about the core slots value of each trait when deciding whether you want it or not. And then, uh, you know, that was back when the game first came out and then, um, you know, the meta got discovered and people found the broken strategies and I did another guide on traits called the power four which was all about basically four traits which are when combined together they make for an incredibly overpowered uh, set of traits which allow you to basically get away with uh, farming the enemy for uh, for resources and you also take a lot less damage because you don't actually attack the enemy anymore you just you just surround them and wait for them to uh, to suppress. So, I mean, that basically means that you would never you would never fight an enemy at full strength, which is really powerful. Anyway, <clears throat> the power four are still as powerful as they ever were, but some new traits have been introduced. I never really discussed the negative ones in too much detail, and of course, soon I will be starting a grand campaign. So, the question is, has anything changed? Because if you're going to start a grand campaign, you're going to be stuck with these traits for a very, very long time. <clears throat> so, the first thing I would say is, think about what the grand campaign is. It's a really long, really slow tech progression. That means that some things are going to become more powerful or easier to deal with and some things are going to become less powerful or uh, harder to deal with because of that slow progression. <clears throat> so keep that in mind um, and spoiler alert the power four are still incredibly powerful so uh, if you just want to take the power four and move on with your life you totally can. Um, the power four by the way um, I'll just select something on this side so I can select them all. The power four being Master of Blitzkrieg, um, Deadly Grasp, Flexible Command, and Perimeter Control. These four are still just as uber as they ever were. So if you want to grab them and move on with your life, you certainly can do. Obviously, you're going to have to pick a negative trait to pay for them. But we're going to come to that in a second. Okay, so let's start with... Uh, the negative side of things because this is going to be the easiest and quickest to go through. Inept Logistics gives you 10% less core slots. That's a pretty severe malice. However, there was a good combination with it to take it and Panzer General and just focus on tanks. The theory being, of course, that, you know, if over 12.5% of your army was tanks, roughly something like that, 13% of your army was tanks, um, then it was worth it. It was worth the trade-off. And in the standard campaign, um, there are a lot of very expensive tanks that you could use towards the mid and late part of the war that could make up the bulk of your army. So you weren't waiting too long, because er early on in the campaign, in the standard campaign, the tanks are not that great. But once you get to the mid and late parts of the war, tanks become probably half your army, depending on your preferences. But there are a lot of fantastic tanks, and it, it would make sense to take a lot of them. So this combination was pretty good. In the Grand Campaign, I think that this is actually pretty bad combination now, because that whole early and mid-war mid is going to be dragging on for a really long time, and a lot of tanks are not that great for a long time. So, you know, you're playing the ultra long game here and probably for not much benefit. So I wouldn't bother. <clears throat> Next, no overstrength, I think, is a horrible negative to take because there are heroes that grant zero slots, for example. Um, and there are a lot of heroes that operate a lot more efficiently with an overstacked unit. Basically, overstrengthening a unit is not efficient, typically. 
But when you add heroes to the mix, it becomes horrendously efficient, and that's when o no overstrength becomes really punishing. So I wouldn't really bother with that. But I wouldn't say it's it's I wouldn't say it's horrible to deal with either. You know, I'd like I'd give this like a B because you could get away with it with Panzer General. There's a real strategy there. I'd give this a C because it's okay. It's not going to ruin you, but it's not great either. Denied Air Force is uh, one that you can live without. Um, <laughs> no, so there was another strategy with Denied Air Force, and that is to take anti-air veteran. And that works extremely effectively in the normal campaign, because you get an extra point for taking these two. And anti-air veteran turns your anti-aircraft guns into souped-up, plain murdering machines. It's such a fantastic upgrade. So, the fact that you don't have an air force, which you mostly need it for, for fighters to get rid of enemy enemy um, tacticals, you know, you, you, you're saving so many slots because you're not building an air force. So all the points that you would have spent on building an air force, you don't spend them on building an air force. And you would deploy anti-aircraft guns anyway, because they double up as your anti-tank, and they also deter tacticals from just running in and and uh, dropping bombs on your uh, on your artillery. So effectively, when you deny yourself your air force, you're actually saving loads and loads of core slots. Um, the only thing that you're really losing out on is that you don't have tacticals or strat bombers yourself, but you could just field more artillery. And that, more or less, would fill in the role that Tacticals and Strat Bombers play. Because generally speaking, you know... Yeah, Tacticals are a bit better at killing tanks than artillery is ever going to be. But, you know, Strat Bombers are literally there for, for adding suppression, and artillery fills that role just fine. So, it's one of these funny things. If you take it, you have to take Anti-Air Veteran. You have to. But if you do, then um, then it's great. <laughs> I've actually done I've actually done quite a bit of a grand campaign, pretty much almost all the way to the end, um, using denied air force, and I actually felt really powerful. It felt really good. Now, in terms of the new grand campaign, taking this is more painful than it was because you are relying on aircraft a fair bit, um, at least for the Spanish DLC, probably for some of the others, to do your anti-tank work, because um, there are a lot of tanks in the early and mid phase of the war that are very, very heavily armoured, but have not really very great weapons. So they struggle to kill each other, and that's where your tacticals come in handy. Um, now, just because you are denied the ability to purchase air units does not mean that these ones that you start with are taken away from you, but they'll probably become obsolete pretty quickly. So then you're going to have trouble um, keeping up with the times. Uh, it can still be done, but I definitely think like this is a this is like a, a D grade pick now because. Uh, you you are going to struggle in the uh, in the Spanish DLC at least, and maybe 1939 as well. Um, and it's not like you can capture replacements. Okay, denied artillery. This is the thinking man's pick because so because the grand campaign is a lot slower. You have a lot more fights. That means you have a lot more opportunities to capture things that are the correct technology level. Which means that if you're sort of running something like the Power 4 and Trophies, you can you can run captured artillery and not ever worry about purchasing your own. Because all 10 centimeter artillery is basically the same. All 15 centimeter artillery is basically the same. All 17 and 21 centimeter artillery is basically the same. Artillery is the same in this game 
for every uh, nation and every faction, it's the same. So if you take this and you run trophies, you can just capture enemy artillery. You can just make sure that you capture plenty of enemy artillery and it's going to see you through the war. Um, in the original campaign, I started with a 21 centimeter gun and two 15 centimeter guns. Um, the 21 centimeter gun only because I had a zero slots hero, so I just ran him on that. And <laughs> they, those same three weapons were still exactly the same at you know during the final mission taking on the USA. I'd never changed them. So denied artillery is a uh, is a pretty easy one to deal with because you can just capture enemy artillery. And as long as you're sensible about making uh, artillery captures, equipment captures, um, take yourself trophies so you can get twice as much equipment, you should be able to run enemy enemy 15 centimeters that you have captured pretty much throughout the whole campaign without any trouble whatsoever. Also, a lot of the experimental stuff is um, is artillery. There's a huge selection of of prototypes that are artillery. So if you take denied artillery, you could, in theory, take industry connections and trophies of war together, and you would never really feel the pain. Plus, trophies of war is going to generate tons of extra prestige for you, and because the campaign is extra, extra long, the grand campaign is so many more missions, industry connections is actually going to pay off a lot more. Although there is a problem with industry connections, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So this one, uh, I would definitely consider it. If you're a good player, you can work around it pretty easily. Um, and the artillery that you start with, you start with a couple of 10 centimeter guns. Absolutely fine. <laughs> those will those will sort you out for your anti-infantry needs for the rest of the campaign. Um, if you don't want to use enemy artillery. Um, would be nice to have uh, some bigger artillery to go with them, but uh, you can certainly deal with it very easily. This this is probably uh, a B to A grade pick. You can probably get away with this pretty easily in the Grand Campaign. Not so much in the original campaign, because obviously everything's moving faster um, in the original campaign. And the artillery that you start with in the original campaign is garbage, if I remember correctly. So yeah, I'd definitely consider picking this one. Uh, retrograde is horrible to deal with now. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Because the campaign is so much slower that you're going to be behind the times for so much longer. It's going to hurt you so badly. Um, yeah, I just... Uh, of, you know, once again, you can work around it by capturing any enemy equipment. So, you know, there is a, there are ways and means around it. The problem is, when you take retrograde, you know, there's a date when um, enhanced infantry is introduced. There's a date where enhanced paratroopers are introduced. And the enhanced infantry and the enhanced paratroopers, and just paratroopers full stop, are incredibly useful and you are not going to have them for so long it's going to be there's going to be so many missions that are incredibly painful because the enemy has got access to uh, 1941 grade infantry and you're not going to have access to it possibly for a whole expansion it's really going to hurt you and you can't capture infantry so you will feel that pain even if you have even if you're planning to run your army entirely on enemy equipment. Okay, Green Army. This was a this was a gimme previously because there was an exploit that let you get elite replacements. <laughs> no matter what. Um, you just upgraded a unit and then downgraded it again. Or you downgraded the unit and upgraded it again over strength or whatever. Um, and that would give you elite replacements. <laughs> so, you could... You could cheese this one, so it was a, it was like a free, a freebie. 
Although it did mean that you couldn't you couldn't use a huge amount of elite replacements actually during a mission. Um, so there was still a downside. Uh, now it's pretty, you know, it's pretty horrendous because you have a, a really long campaign ahead of you and you're you're going to be taking damage on pretty much everything all the time and you're going to need to keep your experience levels up um but it's not it's not horrible once again it's more of like a c grade pick like this is like a c grade pick you know you can work around it it's not too bad but it's not great either it's not something i would just take delayed reinforcements i've never seen anyone take this Absolutely horrible. It's an F grade pick. You have to be mental to pick this. <laughs> uh, you're just going to get ground down into the dirt if you if you take this. You you need to be able to make mid battle replacements. You just you just have to. And I think most of the scenarios are designed around it. So don't take this. <laughs> bad bad plan. <laughs> uh, I get I get it. I think the idea is that you would just throw units at the enemy and they would die and then you would, you know, buy replacements and then throw them at the enemy or whatever. Um, play very conservatively with your other stuff. The mental gymnastics that you would have to do to make this work um, are just not worth it. Once again, poor maintenance is like an F grade pick. No one would ever take this because... <laughs> just randomly losing your ability to move or shoot at the start of your turn can be your complete and utter undoing, depending on which units they are and when. Um, and as the game gets harder and drags on, the the timeline for gaining a victory is ever tighter. So, taking this feels like a really bad idea. <laughs> and it is a really bad idea. So I'll give that one a solid F as well. Chaotic Fire is interesting. It's only one point. You only get one point for it. Um, it doesn't affect some units effectively. Like, it doesn't affect strat bombers or, or tactical bombers, right? Because it can only ever shoot once anyway outside of a hero. And they have loads of ammunition. So, that you know, it really doesn't matter. And... It doesn't really affect fighters because, although fighters can counterattack on on your uh, on your turn, I could probably count on one hand the amount of times that a fighter has had to counterattack more than twice. And the typical fighter has got five ammunition, so you'd get a full strength attack, then another full strength attack, then a half strength attack. Um, likewise, standard artillery comes with tons of ammunition, six shots. So, if you have cha Chaotic Fire, you of course would never deploy rockets because they've only got two ammo. You wouldn't deploy flame tanks because they've only got three ammo. Um, and that's it, pretty much. Nothing else is generally going to be that badly affected. Um, once again, tanks and recons have enough ammunition to attack and defend themselves at least once. Um... I guess with tanks doing a lot of overruns, you might run into trouble. But if you're doing loads of overruns, then you're you're probably in the middle of slaughtering the enemy anyway, so it's not such a big deal. It's a single point. You can work around it pretty easily. It's like a C-grade pick. Um, just be careful with what units you deploy, because some units have only got a couple of shots. Uh, certain rocket launchers come to mind. Um, and under Chaotic Fire, those those units are basically useless. But it's not so bad. Inefficient Supply is another C-grade pick. Some units are affected by it, some are not. You can work around it relatively easily. Um, once again, aircraft are basically not affected. Um, if you haven't got Chaotic Fire on, artillery are basically not affected because... They have like six, they have vast pockets of ammunition apart from rocket launchers once again. Um, 
There was, origin in the original game, it was a horrible pick because it only gave you like one fuel and one ammo per turn. Which meant that after about six turns, all of your fast attack units were crawling along the battlefield because they had no fuel and no ammo. Um, but uh, now I believe it gives you half. Half ammo and half fuel. Which is more than enough 95% of the time. So, that's like a C or, or B grade pick. You can get away with this pretty easily. I generally don't bother with it just because... Um, it's annoying to think about. No more no more reason than that. Poor ground control is horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible triple F grade <laughs> pick. Don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I don't see anybody who ever takes this. Um, it just allows the AI to massacre you. Because you need zone of control to stop the AI from getting behind you. And with this enabled, the AI will just run behind your your units and kill your artillery every time. And a lot of the maps are designed so that they can be effectively zone of controlled, but they are not. Uh, they are not so tight that you can actually make a literal wall of units to stop the enemy from getting past you. So don't take it. Um, because you're going to get wrecked. <laughs> Bad idea. Trench slog. I thought originally that this was a give me points, but it's actually a lot it's a lot nastier than than I gave it credit for. Nevertheless, you can work around it. The issue with it is so it says each attack deals 1 point less damage to an enemy's entrenchment. Every unit does 1 damage to an enemy's entrenchment. Artillery does more. <clears throat> and so do strat bombers. So what this meant was, none of your units could unentrench anybody. <laughs> you, are, you know, now I relied quite heavily on engineers to give me uh, entrench uh, entrenchment bypass anyway. So it wasn't so bad. But it does make things like fighters useless. Because your fighters clean up the enemy. Uh enemy aircraft in the first sort of three to five turns usually your fighters are busy slaughtering the enemy's air, air force and then when the enemy's air force is dead the only real use for your fighter planes is to have them remove entrenchment from units or to strafe units that have no entrenchment then they can get some damage done and with trench slog they genuinely just can't do anything <laughs> because they can't remove entrenchment and the same is kind of true for tanks and recons and even anti-tank guns against units that are entrenched. Is that they can't do any damage because of the entrenchment. And they can't even just attack to get rid of the entrenchment either. So it's kind of irritating to deal with. <clears throat> you can definitely work around it. So it's a C grade pick. Uh, slow modernization is a gimme now. So you can only upgrade three units per mission. And that means... Um, it doesn't include overstrength. That means that you can change one unit into another unit. That's an upgrade. Uh, just to be clear. So because the... So this was relatively easy to work around anyway in the, grand, in the standard campaign. Because there are only a couple of points where you get tons of new stuff. Um, 1941 comes to mind and... Um, when you first arrive in the US in the original campaign. Otherwise, you could work around this pretty easily because upgrades just came in at a slow trickle. So it was relatively easy to work around the problem of slow modernization. Now, the DLC, the Grand Campaign, is even slower. <laughs> it's even slower than the original campaign, which means that the trickle of upgrades is even slower, which means that slow modernization is even less of a problem. And it doesn't stop you from just buying brand new high grade stuff. So if if you wish, if you want, you know, I can't even think in the grand campaign of why you would want to, but 
if there's some new fighters or some new tanks or whatever that come in in a flood or a new prototype, you can just buy the unit. You don't have to upgrade a, a, a previous one of the same type. Sure, you're not going to have any experience on it, but you should be able to build that experience back up pretty quickly, um, especially considering the slow pace of this campaign, of the grand campaign. <clears throat> okay, Fear of Unknown, uh, it's another one that is, you know, uh, it, you know, there, there is a new way around Fear of Un Unknown, which is meticulous planning. So what meticulous planning does is it lets you uh, move twice, uh, kind of like how recons do. Recons are actually the one thing that's not affected by Fear of Unknown. <clears throat> uh, but the issue is, so Fear of Unknown has gotten easier to deal with, especially if you take Meticulous Planning, although it's only a single point. But it continues to be a problem with, um, with aircraft. Because it means that you can't move aircraft unless you can see all the space between where they are and where they're going. You don't just have to be able to see the target destination, you need to be able to see the origin, the target, and everywhere in between. Which means that if your airfields are behind your front line, and they're, they're, a gap appears in the fog of war between your airfield and your army, you cannot you cannot order your planes to fly through the gap to attack enemies. It hobbles your ability to use your aircraft effectively. Now, meticulous planning will let you circumvent this a little bit, but the circumvention costs two points, and fear of unknown delivers only one. And the the tangential benefit. To meticulous planning is, I guess, it makes it easier to go through people's zone of control or rearrange your fighters to defend each other um, or to defend your bombers um, or like to attack with aircraft and then withdraw them somewhat afterwards. Uh, but a lot of what meticulous planning would grant you could also be achieved with perimeter control and a recon. So, I don't like it, I prefer not to take it. Um, but you can work around it, so it's like a C grade pick, it's, you know, it's right there in the middle. Um, this slow modernization, by the way, is a gimme, that's an A, that's an A. <laughs> Just take it, take it, take it, take it, it's three points. So easy to deal with. Arrogant, do not get any combat predictions. Ah, oh, don't take this. <laughs> if you, if you, if you are so good at the game and have played it so much that you can take this and it's not a problem, then you don't need a guide. <laughs> you don't need a guide. You don't need help. <laughs> you do need help, but not, <laughs> not with Panzer Corps Two. <laughs> uh, I would rather not sit there with an Excel spreadsheet and try and work out what's going to happen each combat. So. That's, that's like an E for me. Um, you know, in theory, it's a free point, but it really isn't. Okay, can I assign maximum one hero per unit? This is pretty, pretty horrible. It's like D or E grade horrible. Because in the grand campaign, as I said, it's a very slow campaign. Lots of missions, smaller force sizes. And since you, since you get a hero every win, that hasn't changed. It will not take long for you to have more heroes than you do units. So you will actually find yourself sitting on a load of heroes that you can't use after a while. Additionally, some heroes are only good when they are combined with other heroes. Um, so, you like, for example... Um, Uber unit, which adds five overstrength possibility and zero slots combined together to be great. 
because it means you can have like a 20 strength unit and not pay any slots for it. Whereas, if you couldn't combine them together, Uber unit is, is useless. Like, why would you want a 20 strength unit if you have to pay, um, <laughs> oof, like three times the core slots for it? Three times? That's pretty, that's pretty bad. That's pretty severe. So, I, I wouldn't touch this. Um, but some people pick this actually because they think heroes are overpowered and some of the combinations definitely are. I agree with that. So they take this as a limitation to themselves um, to not abuse certain hero combinations which can be pretty broken. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can take it if you want, but you're you're definitely going to have spare heroes if you, if you pick this um, after a while. Probably by the time you're done with the Spanish campaign and you're importing into 1939, you're going to start to... Um, you're going to start to have a spare bank of heroes. Um, but heroes can be sold. Uh, this is a new thing. Heroes can be sold for a thousand prestige. It's not in the manual anywhere. It wasn't in the game when it first came out. It's a it's a recent change. Recent-ish change. So your spare heroes can be sold for a thousand prestige each. So <clears throat> if you do have a load of spare heroes and some of them are just not very good, uh, you can just sell them. <laughs> um, and this might encourage you to do that. So, uh, yeah, it's it's up to you. Um, I wouldn't pick it if you're trying to make the most powerful selections possible, though. But it's there for you. Ruthless, never accept surrender. One point? <laughs> you, could, you could sell this to me for five points and I wouldn't take it. <laughs> Maybe six points and I wouldn't take this. <laughs> That's horrible. Oh, it's so bad. So, not only... Not only will the enemy never surrender, so they'll always fight to the death, which is going to make it, you know, that much harder to smash the enemy front line. But you will never, ever get any captured equipment. You'll never get any prestige for capturing the enemy. That's horrible. It's, it's so bad. It's so bad, I can't believe it's minus one. It could be minus five or minus six, and I would still struggle to recommend it. Because capturing is just so powerful, so valuable, and forcing surrenders can be so efficient, especially with uh, very powerful, very big units that are hard to kill, that, um, <laughs> ah, it gives me a... It gives me a migraine just thinking about picking this choice. Do this if you want. If you want a serious challenge, like a really serious challenge, pick this. Because on generalismus difficulty, it's all about farming prestige from the enemy because you're not going to get any from capturing and uh, from the mission. You're going to get very little. And Ruthless makes, makes sure, ensures that you cannot farm the enemy. So... Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to follow into slow reaction. Uh, enemy units do not shoot back when attacked by the enemy. This is really nasty. <clears throat> Don't pick this. <laughs> it's, um... I wouldn't say it's as bad as Ruthless, but it's, it's pretty bad. It's, it's almost as bad as, or equally as bad as poor ground control, because... A lot of the reason why the enemy don't attack you is because they're going to take too much damage. And some of the reason why overstrength is quite powerful is if you had a 10 stack of units, the enemy would attack you and do damage. But if you have a 15 stack, the enemy will think, oh, I won't attack because I'll get massacred. And so you save yourself a lot of damage. And what this does is it guarantees that the AI will attack you no matter what. Whether it's to get one casualty or one suppression, the AI is going to come at you like a Scotsman over a rolling hill screaming freedom. The AI is going to come at you and try and smash you because it, it will greatly affect the AI's brain. 
the way the AI thinks. And it will think that every attack is worth it. And they will be. <laughs> they will be worth it. They'll throw... They'll throw 15 heavy infantry at your tank in the open to get one kill. Whereas previously, they wouldn't have done that because they would have gotten one kill, maybe. But then the tank would have wiped out the whole regiment, you know, in a single blast. So the AI thinks, well, that's a, that's a bad idea. <laughs> I won't do it. But with slow reaction on, of course, you're not going to shoot back. So the AI is going to think, oh yeah, I'm going to get one kill. <laughs> and I'm not going to take any damage, so I'll attack. So th this is going to make the AI hyper-aggressive like, um, you know, like Gandhi from Civilization after the diplomacy upgrade. <laughs> you're, you're going to be in for a world of hurt if you pick this. So, so don't. I wouldn't say it's as bad as Ruthless or uh, poor ground control. But it's getting there. So, you know, this is not a C grade. Maybe take it, maybe not. It's up to you. This is a solid, a solid F. Don't touch it. <laughs> I would, I, I, I don't know if I would like to see this because you guys have probably asked for me to do it. But I would love to see a poor ground control, um... Uh, ruthless and uh, slow reaction campaign <laughs> because I can't imagine how you would deal with any of them individually all three of them uh, it just breaks my mind to think about it okay that's all the negatives covered Whew. now we got all the positives to go through but this will be much quicker because <clears throat> there's not really much to uh, uh, there's not really much to discuss with the positive ones. They haven't really changed very much. There's some new ones, but they're not that great. Well, one of them's alright. So, okay, let's go through. Uh, Infantry General, once again, same as the base, same as the original traits guide. Don't really recommend it because you don't have enough infantry to make it worth it. And... In the Spanish campaign, you don't even get any infantry at all, so you're basically taking this for later. Uh, later parts of the war when you actually will have infantry. But infantry will never make up more than 10% of your army anyway, at the most, because it's expensive. Um, you need it. You need it. You have to have it to clear out cities and towns and stuff. It's just necessary. But it will never be more than 10% of your army, and infantry is quite expensive to run, so you wouldn't necessarily want to run more infantry. You know, it's one of those things that it's essential to have, but the cost the cost is, is there. Panzer General, once again, it's not going to come into play until much later in the Grand Campaign. You can take it, for sure, um, but just note that you're going to be slogging through a lot of the campaign without really getting a huge benefit out of it. Industry Connections has actually gotten a lot better because the campaign is so much slower, the Grand Campaign is so much slower, that means more missions, that means more prototypes. Uh, you do training missions, you get prototypes, blah blah blah. Now there is a, as I mentioned earlier, there is a bug with this. I don't know if it's been fixed, but I'm going to mention it anyway. It is possible to get auxiliary prototypes in the Spanish DLC, um, in the later ones, not it's not an issue. Um, auxiliary prototypes are obviously kind of useless because they will just disappear. They'll just disappear when you move on to the next mission. So a lot of your industry connection perk can be wasted in the very first campaign, in the very first DLC. But I still think that this is actually a great pick for a single point. Because things are moving so much more slowly, getting prototypes that are like six months, I think it's up to six months, uh, more advanced than where you are, uh, is actually a pretty big deal. And it will also allow you to get artillery for your denied artillery. Because a lot of prototypes are artillery. Um, as the game progresses, you get hardly any new infantry at all. If any. 
the odd new fighter and and tactical bomber, etc. You get a few. You get some amount of new tanks. You get some small amount of new um, anti-tank guns. There are hardly any uh, recon upgrades. I think there's like three or four in the whole game. Um, although you do get like motorbikes and a few other little bits and pieces, but not a huge amount. And then, in the artillery category, you get all these different variants of rockets and uh, artillery variants and stuff. Um, so, you actually have quite a high chance of picking up artillery as prototypes. <clears throat> if you're not going to get artillery, you'll often get tanks. Because that's the other thing where there's like a big selection of prototype stuff. So, yeah, this is actually pretty solid now. It's, uh... And I think it's actually quite a fun pick for a grand campaign. Because it's going to add a little bit of spice to each mission to see what you've got. Next. Liberator. It's a solid C-grade pick. There are better ways to make money, but it's a very easy way to make money. Um, I ran this in my original campaign. I did not know about the Power 4 at that time. So that's why I went for it. It's a solid C. Deep Recon, once again, it's a single point. It's not that great, though. Um, yeah. 5% more accuracy for Recon. It's okay. Um, if you have a spare point and you really can't think of anything better to do with it, then take it. Operational Initiative is something that is actually a lot better than I gave it credit for because it gives you plus one to initiative forever. <clears throat> and that means that in a mirror matchup, for example, your infantry against their infantry, right? Because infantry have more or less got the same stats for everybody. Or your particular grade tanks against their particular grade tanks or, or recons or whatever. It will actually allow you to get a few more kills <clears throat> and otherwise defend yourself better and take less damage. Um, and for a single point, that's pretty solid. Um... The fact that you get a lot more initiative on the first three turns, I really wouldn't worry about that too much, because I'm not sure that really helps you that much, but plus one initiative for the whole of the mission is actually pretty solid. So it's definitely one to consider, it's a solid B. Okay, Blitzkrieg, it's one of the power four. It It's... It's not just the extra movement, it's the fact that rivers become something that, <clears throat> as standard, would just drain all your movement points entirely, but become something that you can just literally run past and still have enough movement left to move a couple of spaces. It, it's actually pretty huge what this does for you. It's one of the power four for a reason. Oh, Battle Academy. It was bad before. It was bad in the standard campaign. It's terrible now. <laughs> the campaign is so much longer. You have so many more missions with which to build up your experience. You will not... Oh, you just won't have a problem building up the EXP on your units. I can't think of any reason why you'd want to build them up 25% faster and that is worth two points. It's not even worth one point, in my opinion. The only thing I can think it'd be useful for is like... If you combined it with, uh... Green Army. As an offset to Green Army. Um, which would get you a point. But 25% extra EXP is not even a great... Like, it's not even a huge amount extra. So, if you think about it, what that means is... When you reach 1 star normally... With this, you would get 1.25 star. When you reach 2 star normally, you would be up to 2.5. Well, the limit for the first part of the Grand Campaign is 2.5 star. Then it's 3.5, then it's 4. I just, I don't see a world in which you're going to have trouble padding out your EXP. You may save some prestige here and there using standard replacements instead of elite ones, but there are easier, better ways to make prestige. So, that's an F from me. 
Okay, auxiliary force is... Uh, it allows you to basically turn prestige into power and then deploy it for one turn on, uh, for one mission only if you're struggling with a particular mission. But obviously this is going to cause you to bleed prestige and I think, you know, every mission is designed to be beaten with a standard army. You don't need a 1.5x army to win any mission. Um, I guess it could be useful, like, it can, it's not a bad pick, for example, fighters are really cheap, and you could, you, you could pick this, you could deploy extra fighters, um, or you could deploy nothing but auxiliary fighters, clean up the enemy air force, then not really worry about the fighters from that point on, and deploy more, more bombers that are actually part of your core army. You know there there are ways of using and abusing it, but it it is a it is a way for you to sink um, sink prestige. So it's good, but um, it's going to cost you. So in that case, I'm not really that sure about it. Trophies of War is hilariously overpowered now. I mean, it was overpowered before, but it's even more more overpowered now. Because the campaign is so much longer and so much slower. There's more opportunities to capture equipment. Much the same reasons as... Um, same reasons as why Industry Connections is good. Makes Trophies of War even better. Um, this is how you're going to farm prestige and equipment. And have a tip-top state-of-the-art top-of-the-line army throughout the whole length of the Grand Campaign. You're going to be drowning in enemy equipment. So, yeah. Take it, of course. Deadly Grasp, just as powerful as it ever was. Part of the Power 4 for a good reason. Really OP. Take it and enjoy uh, your enemy being unable to do anything <laughs> once you've got once you got the surround on them they were they're not going to be able to do anything to you whatsoever flexible command now flexible command and perimeter control are the other two parts of the power four you'll notice here that I actually don't have enough points to take them both because I took operational initiative um, it's a pretty solid pick but if you're only gonna take one of the power four uh, sorry if you're gonna not take one of the power four Perimeter control is the other is the one that you probably won't take. This allows you to cancel enemy zone of control, so you can go sliding past them. Um, but flexible command is more important for having more units to uh, to surround the enemy with. But uh, all all four of the power four are pretty key to getting the job done. But the thing is, with Master Blitzkrieg, you're so much faster. You can actually go around the enemy a lot of the time, even though they have zone of control. Um, but yeah. That's the other two of the power four. And uh, trophies just means that you make a fortune out of it. Okay, so anyway. I'm just going to untick these for now. Uh, killer team... I can tell you here, this is inside information, that our sen uh, scenario designer uh, takes this perk. He just spends his two points on this and then moves on. <laughs> Killer team is just as good as it ever was. Very powerful, very good, um, very solid choice. Now, because the campaign is so much longer, you are going to get many, 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 many more heroes over the course of a long campaign, including some special ones. Um, which sort of diminishes this a little bit, but as always, if you take killer team, you can always uh, restart, restart, restart until you get a killer team that you like. And if you do that, it's probably still one of the most powerful picks that you can possibly get, uh, especially if you get a load of zero slot heroes, or uh, double fire, or double move, or double attack. There are a lot of really nice heroes out there that you can get, so... Once again, it's a very solid pick. I'm not sure I'd choose it over the uh, the Power 4. But, 
There is a real discussion as to whether you would want killer team or trophies. Because, as long as you are solid at capturing, you can more than generate enough prestige and captured equipment to fuel your army. You don't need this, it's kind of overkill. But, you know, overkill can be very nice. But if, if you're good at farming, then you don't really need this. Then it can make sense to take Killer Team, right? To get some, ex some extra power in terms of heroes. Especially since the Grand Campaign is going to involve using a smaller army for a much longer period of time. Those heroes are really going to show themselves. Going to show their value <clears throat> over the course of a long campaign. So, yeah, once again, this could be a solid pick. Okay, anti-air veteran. If you're running without an air force, this is mandatory. It is an incredibly powerful pick. Uh, it makes anti-aircraft guns <clears throat> a lot better. Like, a lot, a lot better. But... If you are running with an air force, good heroes on a fire plane will kill the enemy aircraft, you know, in a reasonable time frame. So you don't really need it. <clears throat> but if you're not running aircraft, then you definitely need this. So it's a great pick, but there are a lot of great picks. Okay, perimeter control, it's one of the power four. Um, they are plugging my power four video. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's part of the it's part of the f the fact the uh, the four parts of the uh, of the recipe for uh, stealing all the things. So I wouldn't really, you know, uh, I w I wouldn't unselect it because it is the it's the parts that make up the whole that allows you to just steal everything. Okay, meticulous planning. <clears throat> sort of gives you pseudo recon ability on your on your vehicles <clears throat> but honestly you can achieve a lot of the same things with perimeter control and it costs two points and there are just better things there are just better things to buy with two points can only assign one hero to every unit we discussed this earlier it's not a great pick oh sorry can assign one extra hero unit we discussed earlier the uh, the inability to assign more than one. Um, <clears throat> you really don't need four heroes. <laughs> you really don't need four heroes on your units. That's kind of overkill. Now that said, you will have more heroes to use, as the Grand Campaign will go on for much longer, and your force size will grow more slowly. So there will be use for it. But, I mean, if you're sticking four heroes on something, you're probably... Uh, it's probably overkill. <laughs> it's probably not necessary. It is only a single point, though. But I think there are better things for a single point. Now, Terrain Expert is the only one of the new things which I think is really good. Quietly really good. So here's the thing. Plus one base entrenchment means 10% less damage taken from tanks and 8% less damage taken from infantry and like 2% less damage taken from artillery. <clears throat> so what this does is it effectively gives you a damage reduction in all situations. Um... And that's pretty powerful. That's pretty good. Because that's also going to affect the way the AI thinks about you. The AI is worried about how much damage it's going to do relative to how many casualties it's going to take. And this means that it's going to do less damage to you and take more casualties. Which may dissuade it from attacking in the first place. So this is quietly a very powerful pick in its own right. And it's something that I would potentially go for if I wasn't going for the power four. And then finally, friendly units do not lose their attack action when deploying from organic transports. This allows you to use artillery as if it were mechanized. 
more than anything else, but totally unnecessary once you understand how to deploy your artillery so that it's got a shot each turn. Uh, you never... You shouldn't be in a situation where you need to move, then fire your artillery. You should be in a situation where you fire your artillery, then move it so that it has a shot next turn. And you get used to that very, very quickly. So this is kind of pointless. So! Whew! That was a lot to discuss. So, breaking it down. Denied artillery and slow modernization are the easy choices to take from the negative side. They're very easy to deal with. If you're going to take the power four, then take these. You're going to be rich beyond your wildest dreams as you capture everything that isn't nailed down. And you're going to use your captures to fuel uh, your, your lack of artillery. You're going to use industry connections and trophies of war to capture and acquire all the artillery that you need and all the prestige that you need and you're going to use your power for which is Master Blitzkrieg, Deadly Grasp, Flexible Command and Perimeter Control you're going to use the power for to murder the enemy. If you don't want to use the power for because you don't want to capture everything you want to actually fight the enemy and play a game where you actually fight rather than rather than capture everything then I recommend that you change from that power force setup. Turn off your denied artillery because you're not going to be capturing any artillery. That gives you four points to play with. So take the killer team. <clears throat> That's going to give you a lot of extra power. And then I would potentially consider taking Terrain Expert, which is going to reduce incoming damage by 10%, and Operational Initiative, which is going to mean that when, when an attack happens, either offensively or defensively, shots are taken based on initiative and then traded until all shots are taken. And what these two together are going to do is they're going to create a situation where you take less damage and you deal more damage in every combat by a good margin, by like 20%-ish. So these together are going to allow you to uh, fight the enemy and just enjoy a solid uh, 20, 20 or so percent advantage in every combat, like for like. And your extra heroes, depending on what they are, are going to add a great deal of extra power. So those are your choices. If you want to fight the enemy and you don't want to capture everything, take slow modernization because that's easy to deal with and take these. These are going to grant you power to just win fights straight up. And if you are going to go power 4 and you're going to play the capture game, take denied artillery because industry connections and trophies are going to allow you to farm all the artillery and prestige you could ever want. And then go ahead and grab your power four. So your deadly grasp, your uh, flexible command, perimeter control, and your master of blitzkrieg. That's your power four sub. Um, and that is it for now. I hope this helps someone out there. I will probably be using one of these two setups for my generalismus campaign. I haven't decided which yet. I think the fighty version would be more interesting to watch, maybe. I don't know. Some people really enjoy watching me capture and farm. <laughs> farm the enemy for everything they're worth. So, you know, it is what it is. But I shall give that some thought for my campaign coming up soon. And I hope you guys found this video, which is an hour long, helpful. <laughs> wow. But so much to talk about. And I will see you guys next time.